So first of all, um, we've been uh, blessed to have what I've described as a pretty consistent rollout for the better part of the past six weeks from uh, Pfizer and Moderna. And, um, and there's going to be another increase, modest, but it's on a much bigger base than it used to be on uh, next week of both of them. Uh, we think the, uh, the best thing for us to do at this point in time is follow the federal guidance, wait and see what comes from their review with respect to those six cases and any decisions they believe we or others should be making going forward. Um, do the best we can to make sure we reschedule appointments for people that were scheduled for J&J &J and continue to pursue the program that we've got in place. Um, we're basically on track with where we thought we were going to be back in December, um, despite some of the bumps along the way. And, and as I said, the, the J&J &J and, uh, um, and the issues associated with that, the feds need to, need to buckle down on and, and, and decide how they believe we uh, should move forward. But in the meantime, we have very significant Pfizer and Moderna supplies, and we expect that to continue. I don't know the answer to that because it's going to depend completely on what the feds decide based on their review of those cases. My point is that it's a relatively small part of our, um, of our distribution to date, and we do have and expect that we'll continue to see modest growth in the Pfizer and, and Moderna supply going forward. And, and we've been able, as I said, to continue to maintain a, an administration rate and a vaccination rate that was pretty consistent with what we thought we were going to be able to do back in December, even with some of the issues around supply. Yeah, but you talked a lot about Johnson & Johnson, how it was going to be a better solution because of a one-shot. Um, and I think Heinz is going to convert to all J&J, &J too, as part of the FEMA program. What are you guys doing just to try to re-engineer the distribution on the back end? So you were really heavily relying on well, obviously, we're going to wait and see what the guidance we get from the feds looks like. But the goal here would be to continue to do um, the outreach activities that we've been doing. And we'll just focus those for the time being using um, Pfizer and Moderna supplies. Um, Dr. Some people were also complaining that they didn't get a lot of information yesterday. They were you know, trying to get their shot. We heard from the command center, of course, but the governor didn't come out. And, you know, this was, this was a major blow to the Well, I mean, remember, most of the doses that we administer here in the Commonwealth, the vast majority of the doses we administer are Pfizer and Moderna doses. And I've always thought of the J&J &J as sort of the accelerant to where we already are. Um, but at this point in time, we're going to wait and see what the feds got, you know, what federal guidance looks like on this after they complete their investigation. But we still have a fairly significant base that we're building on. We have a ton more capacity, and we've talked about that before. Um, and if the supply is there, with or without J&J, &J, we're going to have no trouble making sure that we administer it. Does this J&J &J news make it an even harder sell to convince people who are reluctant in the first place to come forward and get a vaccination? Are they seeing this news and going, I think the most important thing I can say about vaccinations generally is um, the impact it's had on some of the most vulnerable communities in Massachusetts and across the country and frankly around the world is pretty clear at this point. The vaccines work. I mean, if you look at the population, if you look at the hospitalization rates and the case rates among those groups of people who've been vaccinated, They've evaporated, and in many cases involve some of the folks that we were most concerned about. I think the vaccines remain safe and effective. And I would argue that, uh, in some respects, the decision that the FDA and the, and the CDC made here based on six cases out of seven million administered uh, to put a pause on this and take a look at it is an example of the system working the way it should. You know, in an abundance of caution, they put out the word and said, we need to take a look at this. Um, and that's what they're doing. And I think I got asked the same question about Baltimore. And I said Baltimore to me was the same thing, which is pretty clear these guys, you know, saw there was an issue, stopped it, ran the investigation. That's what you want the process to be. There should be a self-correcting mechanism in there.
I, th I think we're going to con we're, we'll use whatever vaccine is available. Um, the the rules and the and the logistics will be different, but we've demonstrated over the course of the past several months um, that we can work um, with whichever product is available to us and we'll continue to do that and our goal is to continue to build on the success we've had so far uh, and with programs like this to make sure we have um, a process and a set of uh, partners who can help us make sure that we get to uh, folks in in those most disproportionately impacted communities and get them vaccinated as well Well, we're talking now about two or three weeks um, of incredible inconvenience for everybody. Um, I think it's our expectation that by this weekend this issue will be resolved. Um, I would love everybody to be able to get their sticker when they're supposed to. Um, and, uh, and, and I think the most important thing uh, I can say about this is that we are going to make, we've talked to our colleagues in law enforcement, we've talked to a lot of folks at the registry, we're going to make sure that people have the opportunity and the, and the window to actually get uh, their car inspected when they need to. Do you think there might be some cars, though, that shouldn't be on the road? If this thing was dragging on for a really long time, I'd start to worry about that. But if it's a two or three week uh, issue, it's a, it's, a, it's a tremendous inconvenience, but I don't think of it as a public safety issue. Well, I certainly think we have trusted partners here who know these communities well and are respected and, and trusted by them. I don't know if, if either Alberto or uh, Robert want to speak specifically to that. Just talking about how it would be so effective, like the whole process of doing a Red Sox week, a focus on certain Well, there are challenges. One of them that we addressed, like in light speed, was putting a phone number that tomorrow will have our community, my particular community, does not respond as well to email links and so forth. We know that. So tomorrow there'll be a phone number that will be um, uh, distributed through all media channels, not just Telemundo. We're asking all our colleagues in the media like Telemundo to help us with that. So there are definitely challenges that we're, we're, we're obviously addressing. But I think that you know we have folks like Pedro Martinez, Big Papi, who um, folks in our community at least catch their attention. We're going to be using those as a focus point. And more importantly is our community tends to wait to the last minute. It's, so I believe that on Monday and Tuesday when there's a buzz, when hopefully some of you guys show up, and I'm asking you guys to show up and kind of show this fun atmosphere, it helps move the needle. But it is a challenge because it's one of the communities that um, there's least has, that has the most hesitance, and, uh, and we're trying to kind of create a fun environment, a fun message uh, that's very important. Sam Kennedy, can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. Oh, Sam, you need to, yes, sir. Since we I guess it the, depends on what the question is. <laughs> well, I mean, you've got the governor here right with you. Would you like to see uh, increased capacity at Fenway since it's outside, more people are having vaccines, and, and do you think it would be a safe environment if you want to make a pitch? Yeah, that, that's the easiest question I'll get uh, all day. Of course, the answer is yes, um, but we'll do it at a time when the health officials and uh, our government officials tell us it's the right time. Uh, we, we, you know, the special thing about Fenway Park is the energy from the fans. Um, and we're all dying to get back to some sense of normalcy, but we can only do that at the appropriate time. And that is, we're, we're hopefully we're good at operating a baseball team and a uh, and a sports venue, uh, but we are not doctors, and so we'll leave that to the experts. And hopefully that'll happen sooner rather than later. We're really excited to welcome our fans back when it's when it's appropriate to do so. Great question. Yeah, I was talking to Alex Cora uh, actually on the way over here, and um, uh, in addition to asking him to please win two more uh, today in, in Minneapolis, um, he actually said, uh, do me a favor, tell the Gov. So I'm going to tell the Gov. Uh, Alex said, whatever he needs to do to help spread the word uh, in the community about the importance of vaccination, uh, he's all in. So we can count on our leader, Alex Cora, to do that. And uh, many of our players uh, are going to get vaccinated. Um, and we're looking forward to that as well. And that, that, I think, sets a good example for everyone else. What would that look like? Would that be a public service announcement? 
Yeah, public service announcement. We have a great following on social media, so creating messages from our players. Uh, Alberto mentioned Pedro Martinez and David Ortiz, who have already engaged in uh, PSAs and using our television network, Nessun, our radio uh, following, just to spread the word about the importance of, of getting uh, vaccinated. As the governor said, it is uh, the, the key to getting out of this situation. So we encourage all of our fans uh, all across New England and all across the world uh, to get vaccinated. Thank you. Uh, the, the short answer to that is no. Um, do you want to speak to this one, Mary Lou? I forgot to wear my red, white, and blue today. <laughs> Sorry about that, Sam. Um, so uh, obviously we're waiting for the, the guidance that comes out from the CDC and FDA and their meeting today, and that will sort of guide um, our decisions, but we are quite capable of taking the homebound program and converting it into a, a two-dose program. So if that's uh, what we need to do, uh, it's not to stop the homebound program at all. We'll just have to we'll convert it into a two-dose program. Makes it a little bit more logistically challenging, but we can certainly do that. And several of our mobile programs at this point use uh, Moderna. So you know, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a bump. Um, and we're looking forward to getting the, the, the guidance from the uh, FDA and the CDC, and we'll, we'll pivot accordingly. Last question. Governor, how long, how long is, will it be uh, before uh, everybody has been registered to actually get this How long is it? The hard part about answering the question about uh, pre-registration is people do. I mean, pre-registration, we've discovered for a lot of people, is what I would call the safety valve, right? They pre-register and they wait to hear back from uh, the pre-registration system, but they continue to chase appointments. And as I said, you know, out of the million and a half people, plus or minus, who pre-registered, we've had about 300,000 people who unregistered, which says to us that they went and got an appointment somewhere else. So um, it's a hard question to answer when you say, how long would it take somebody? What I can say is, generally speaking, you know, and this is based on nothing more than um, what I would describe as, as sort of big numbers looked at and analyzed and processed and then some, you know, estimates. It's about two or three weeks from the time you pre-register, although it depends a little bit on where you live and, um, and whether or not you choose to stay on the site or take the first opportunity you have to book an appointment. There's also a bunch of people who don't take the first opportunity and come back and take the second one. Some of that will depend a little bit on the on the the Pfizer and Moderna supply, right? Pfizer said yesterday they're going to up their production. Moderna sort of implied they would do the same thing, um, but I do think we will we will be able to have a significant. I mean, if you think about it, there's already a ton of people who are in the process who've been first dosed and are going to get second dosed, and a ton of people who are going to get first dosed who will then at some point in May get second dosed. Um, I think you know. Hundreds of thousands of people, maybe millions. It's 31 days in May, and we got another 15 days in April. Um, I think we can get to the point where very significant, yeah, right. And we'll have 2 million people done probably by Saturday. Um, I think by the time you get to Memorial Day, a ton of people in Massachusetts will have been vaccinated. Yeah. I do want to. Remember, yeah, but remember, you're talking really small numbers, relatively speaking. You know, we got very small. We had 12,000, 11,600 doses of um, of J and J for the week we're in now, and we got 380,000 doses of Pfizer and Moderna. So um, there's definitely some logistical issues there. Um, but the truth of the matter is, the bulk of our vaccination program from the beginning has been Pfizer and Moderna. Yeah, 
Yeah. I don't think I don't think because there's not that much J and J that's currently in the pipeline. I don't think it changes that much. Um, I always thought of it more as a significant way to dramatically increase the the delivery of the capacity we already have. I mean, remember, I've said this many times. The we have probably a two times or a three times daily capacity to vaccinate than we actually get supply. And in my mind, I always thought of the J&J &J as a piece that would be um, a significant part of sort of amping it to the next level. If it's there and the feds tell us that they believe that it's safe, um, that's one thing. But if they don't, like I said, this is a program that's built primarily on the, on the back of, of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. I'm so surprised that you want to follow up on that, Jonathan. It's a long season. Um, the, we have tried since the beginning of this to be respectful of two competing concerns. One is the public health and safety of the people of the Commonwealth. And the second is the mental health and psychological health and economic health of the people of the Commonwealth. And those two things are the way we practice almost every decision we make about trying to balance those. Because anybody who says there's not a downside or an upside in either of those uh, areas when we make decisions is just not paying attention. And um, we currently are dealing with some very significant variants. It's not news. Many of you have reported on it. And those variants are far more contagious um, and in some cases potentially more dangerous than uh, what we have seen so far. And uh, it's part of the reason why the vaccination program is so important. And what we've said many times is we want to see how this plays out over the course of several weeks, maybe a month, um, to see where we are before we make decisions about moving forward. Can we just get, we just get your, re your gut reaction when you heard the talk? I know you've done the math and it seems like we're in better shape than we thought, but what was your gut reaction yesterday when you heard Paul's talk? Well, my gut reaction was um, the CDC and the FDA are calling for a pause because they saw in a very small number of cases, something they couldn't explain. And um, therefore, they were going to get a bunch of people together and take a look at these cases and, um, and figure out what the most appropriate response to that would be. So my first reaction was, I'm glad they're taking a look at this based on the available data. Um, but of course, you know, as somebody who wants to see people get vaccinated, I mean, Mary Lou got the J&J. &J. I would take the J&J &J if it had been available, and I'd still take it. Um, but I think it's important for the feds to do their homework on this, because the last thing we want to do um, is make decisions based on anything less than the best available information. And I, I expect at some point in the not too distant future, we'll hear back from the feds and they'll tell us what they think the most appropriate thing to do and the safest thing to do is going forward. And we'll abide by that decision. What we've said is that um, the, the CDC and the FDA's guidance on this one was pretty clear, which was um, the typical reaction that people have to a vaccination, which is, you know, what I would describe as sort of flu-like symptoms and within a day or two or three of, of getting vaccinated is not what they believe the symptoms associated with this look like. They said the symptoms on this are six to 13 days out and are typically severe leg aches, stomach aches, headaches. Um, and they said, if you experience that sort of thing, you should reach out to your provider, period. And 
I think that guidance is is pretty clear for people. If you if you got a J and J and you got it, you know, a month ago, um, you're pretty much outside the window of what the feds believe um, you should be um, considering. But if you're somebody who's sort of inside the window, you should look for those kinds of symptoms. If you see them, you should definitely reach out to your clinician. Thanks, everyone. I think the hard part, of, I can't speak for all providers. Some may, in fact, go ahead and do that. I think the, the bigger challenge there um, is trying to figure out how you would actually process that kind of information. Telling, telling folks what they need to be concerned about and then saying, if you have any of these in this time frame, reach out, I think is a far more effective way of making sure that people who actually do have concerns get in front of a doctor and get in front of a doctor at the appropriate time. Are you talking about the one that was done by the Senate? Yeah, but your EORs are, I think, what the chair of the commission is. Um, anyway, yes. This is Adam Hines' report. We were staffed to that. I don't, I don't think we, we didn't share that, did we? No, we didn't share that. Well, I'm sure that, you know, I'm sure they would have been involved, yeah. But my, my question is, you talk about a lot of tax breaks that should be looked at and reviewed. Is your administration interested in doing that? Um, I have not read the report. I've been kind of focused on what we've been talking about today. Um, but we'll certainly take a look at it at some point, yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you guys for stepping up. And thanks to FEMA for their help on this as well.